Will walked under the elevated train where the panhandlers talked themselves down to a penny with a hole in it, but neither searched his pockets nor apologized, walked on and on, and then heard some voices in drunkenness down a walkway between two buildings on his right, paused, opened the gate, and walked in. If I miss it, he thought, there's always the next bus. There was a crowd around the light, strangers, and he watched from the doorway, his boots pointing toward them, blue shirt once the faded color of his eyes hanging down over his jeans. His eyes had gone steely. He missed the music. Hands reached out and the backs to him began to turn and walk past him, and he shuddered each time a can lost its pressure. He was the stranger. They had nothing to say to him, though. Most met eyes and looked down, and the warm perspiration from walking that fell down his sides spoke for the cold perspiration down the colored aluminum cans that left the light of the refrigerator closed by a girl who held her own and turned and was not frightened by him and said, Sorry, you want one? She made him shudder as she released the tab with one long nail and reached out to offer him the beer. Whiskey, he asked. He didn't move. She lived there and had made the ice herself with filtered water and cracked it right under his face. He showed restraint. She relaxed him through and through, didn't ask him where he was from or who he knew or how he got there or why. None of that crap. What she wanted to know was, would he get himself a glass out of the cabinet? And how did he like it? With water? Tall or short? She didn't laugh at him when he asked for half and half. They went outside and sat on the steps. She said how she hated the city and living with people and entertaining people and was very gentle and calm, telling how she never got a moment's peace. Isn't this one, he asked. The sky was orange and they could hear the change of panhandlers. He wished he had given them the quarters he found beneath his keys in his pocket while he searched it nervously, while she started talking bad about her roommate to him. That was after he grew conscious of himself and the way he was tapping his toe and stopped. She didn't sigh once. She didn't feel sorry for him, or anyone else for that matter. Are you single, she asked him. Yes. I am too, she said, but I don't feel that way. Beautiful girl like you is never really single, he said. I dated one. I couldn't accept all the guys who she knew who looked her up and down, and all the guys she didn't know who looked her up and down, all the girls who looked her up and down. Were you jealous? I was. Well, don't ever be. She showed him her bedroom. They walked past the crowd gathered around the light, hunting inside it for the colored cans. A bead of sweat fell down his side, all the way over the small impression of his ribs to his waist, and he shivered. He needed another whiskey, but the half and half was in a cool light, obscured by, obscured by the kids gathered round. The bottle was on the counter, and he took it with him. When they passed the threshold of her room, her smell was all around them. Marigolds. They began to neck and hold each other. It was all so innocent. The steel fell out of his eyes, and she saw they matched the faded blue of his shirt, and it turned her on greatly. He left at three in the morning, pulled his pants and boots on, and the sheet back over her, took one last swig of the bottle, pushed his hair back with his own hands. Colored cans lay all around the kitchen and nobody in sight. He walked to the door, but turned back and opened the door to the light and found a can toward the back and brought it out. It was cool and wonderful in his hand, in his throat. Night swam and he grabbed hold of whatever he could. Dogs confronted and barked at him. Cats lay on windowsills, swishing their tails to street lamps that turned the leaves of the elm orange. For both young and seasoned, late night had neither rhyme nor reason.